Okay, we should be live. Microphone looks good. Video capture's working. All right, so we're back. We're working on the Grim Captain. Um, we're invoking rule zero. This is the first time you've watched any of my videos on the Grim Captain. Rule zero is that if your playgroup allows it, you can do it. So, since Commander is at its heart a casual format, uh, the Grim Captain is not technically legal as a commander by the way the rules are written, but he's also not, like, insanely powerful compared to other cards, and he is kind of, like, he's so close. His whole purpose is to turn into a legendary creature, so as long as we build around the color restrictions of him being mono-black, since his black backside is... Uh, has the black color identity circle on it, and has the black frame to back that up. Technically, it's only the color identity circle that determines what colors he is. But... So, yesterday when I was working on it, I went over literally every card we still had on the list while cutting some of them out. Going over why they were on there. I didn't intend to have that be the entire video, but that's kind of the way it worked out. So we're back and we're working on it. And one of the things I noticed is that we have way more than I thought cards that exile cards from the opponent's graveyards because we have several mass reanimation spells on the list and we want to be able to exile opponent's graveyards so that they can't get things back. So we're going to go... I think we're going to start by making a list of all of those because we have too many. Um, the deck only has room for 60 spells and 40 lands, roughly. Like, maybe we can get away with a couple less lands because the deck has a very low casting cost overall, but I wouldn't want to go, you know, below, like, 38 lands, because we still need to hit lands pretty consistently. Um, so, I think... The first one is Leyline of the Void, right? That is our very first... Um, Graveyard Exile, I didn't miss one of them up here as I was talking while I was scrolling, and I don't think so. So Leyline of the Void should be the first one. Oh, no, wait. Grave Robber should be the first one. I just realized it's like, wait a minute. Then Grave Robber, it's like, no, Grave Robber was before this. Okay, there we go. So Leyline, Grave Robber... Uh, Can Wanderer cares about the cards in my graveyard. Um, Marrowbonar, technically. Also one of the very few merfolk that are in mono black, so... There's a decent chance of still being in here, despite how terrible it is at its job, and underwhelming it is as a card in general in Commander. None of you guys hate on the graveyard, right? Random Vampires, Butcher, Blood Throne, Drana, oh, Bojuka Bog. I mean, Bojuka Bog's going to take up a land slot anyway, but it is a Graveyard Hate card if I wanted to you like keep track of it as far as this is one more Graveyard Hate card I have. But since I need to exile Graveyards anyway, um, it might just make the list... Even though it's not the best at it, since it can only do it when it comes into play, and there are going to be times where we need to play it where we don't really care about what's in the graveyard at the time, but we need the land for future turns. So. There's also all the cards that, when they deal with stuff, they exile them, but we're going to focus on the ones that... Get rid of cards, like, all of the cards that are going to go to the graveyard, or cards that are already in the graveyard, rather than ones that stop the, like, rather, I worded that wrong, rather than ones that, um, exile the cards as part of their effect, that's more removal, that happens to not allow for graveyard shenanigans, as opposed to something like, uh, a replacement effect that stops the creature from ever going to the graveyard, but isn't actually the thing that kills it in the first place. Like Kalidus' graveyard hate, because he stops the creatures from ever getting to the graveyard. Uh, 
Next one exiles cards from the graveyard and is a pirate, which helps a little bit. Yeah, this might be the first time that I don't run uh, Grave Robber as my graveyard hate card just because there are a handful of them that are on topic that exile specific cards from graveyard, so. Um, these pirates do that. Poisoner, no. No. Okay. Nope. Self mill card. Buy things back. Alice Blood Mage can exile a graveyard. So one of the biggest things to note about Callus Blood Mage versus my argument for Bojuka Bog, where it's like Bojuka Bog we might need to put into play early or when we don't care about graveyards. So there's a similar thing with the Callus Blood Mage being a one-shot, but between the ways we have to bring back dead creatures and the fact that we could exile him and then bring him back with the Grim Captain if we needed to, kind of bypasses that restriction in a way that the Bojuka Bog doesn't, because we don't have ways to sacrifice it, even though we have ways to replay it from the graveyard. So, the Bojuka Bog, once it's in play, is unlikely to ever exile a graveyard for the rest of that game, but the Callous Blood Mage, even though it's a one-shot, has a much higher chance of, like, going away and coming back and re-triggering, so... Misery Shadow. Multiverse, Pile On, Mithril Coat. None of these. Their Triumph. Boss, Preacher, Bike Tail, Throne. Here, swift foot boots. Anything else that hates on the graveyard? Shifter. Void walker, yes. Thank you, tablet. I don't know what you updated, but thank you for letting me know. Uh, Bloodline necromancer, patron of the vein. Coven, Troublemakers, Marie makes the creatures that die get exiled. True Psychic Paper, Creeping Bloodsucker. Those two. Technically, Dino DNA also exiles creatures from graveyards. Exiling creatures is the most important part for this deck. Like, I don't mind being able to exile, like, enchantments or artifacts or instants and sorceries, because there are plenty of commander decks that have ways to recur those card types for value. So we do want to be able to get rid of some of them as well. But for the most part, I care about creatures, since that's what allows our... Um, our living death effects to be more potent. Yeah, if I cut the living deaths eventually, if I decide that that's not a sub-strategy we need, then we can cut a lot more of these and just have a couple of them. But... This is Graveyard Hate. So, Grave Robber is technically first. Then Leyline. Marrow. Kalidus. Jedi. Blood Mage. Shadow. Void Walker. Marie. And Dino DNA.
And somehow I let the one get outside of the thing. Brackets. Alright. So yeah, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten cards. We certainly don't have room for ten. So I think Grave Robber can go. Normally this is my go-to black card for Graveyard Hate. Because eventually it flips into a reanimator, and that's just good value most of the time. But in this particular instance, I would rather we have a pirate, two vampires, and a merfolk, and a dinosaur card that are all exiling cards from the graveyard, technically. And I would much rather have those than the non... Um... Like, the creatures that aren't that type. So yeah, I think we can probably cut Misery, Shadow, and Voidwalker then, too. Like, all of these would normally make the deck before the ones that I'm using. Maybe Kalidus would make it in, just because. But, I'm sorry, three vampires. We have Marie also. So... If I get rid of the Ley Line, then technically all of the cards that I'm using to exile graveyards are the relevant creature types. Or make creatures of the relevant type in the case of Dino DNA. So at this point, it just seems better to get rid of all of the ones that aren't the relevant creature type. Alright, so we'll get rid of Grave Robber. And Misery Shadow. Healthy Void Walker. And Leyline. One, two, three, four cards off the list. <clears throat> we might need to cut one more. Or even two more, but hopefully we don't need to cut any more than that. If we cut any more than that, I'll probably have to bring in um, Scavenging Grounds. And possibly, like, one or two other deserts, just to make sure we have enough graveyard hate. Or we would have to cut the, um, the Living Death effects, uh, Living Death, Twilight's Call, and Bringer of the Last Gift. Alright. What else can we cut? If we go through the list now... I wonder if I should check the self-mill cards and see if I can cut, like, one or two of them. We'll eventually need to do that anyway, but for right now I'm just going over the list and seeing what we still have. So, when I got to here before and I started seeing, like, the higher casting cost vampires... I was not thinking of some of the other larger ones we have, and so, like, a 6-mana 3-4 flyer that buffs my entire team as they deal combat damage to creatures uh, seemed like a decent play, but we do have so many better things. The fact that it makes everything a vampire, though, means that we could use other cards, but we're cutting all of the non... Uh, for creature types, basically, with very few exceptions, and the ones that we're keeping probably aren't the best for turning into vampires so that we can exile them instead. Like, Stinkweed Imp, we want to die, so that way we can mill five cards to get it back to set up our graveyard. Um, the Demon, we want in play so that other things can die around it and we can mill. Um, so far, only the Delver, I think really wants to, like, get turned into a vampire so that we can exile it and bring it back later with the Grim Captain. And I don't even know that that one's going to make the list, if only because we need the room and it's not one of the creature types and it's not, like, one of the focuses of our deck. 
it just happens to be a good value card, and we do run some other reanimate spells, so. Yeah, maybe we can cut the Mephidros Vampire then. We have a bunch of other, like, high-impact vampires on our list. I do think the Skeletal Vampire is still good as a mana sink for when we have uh, Coffers or Nithos going and producing a ton of mana uh, just to make a whole bunch of bodies. <clears throat> Unfortunately, none of the other vampires that care about bats have made it, because there are very... There are actually very few of them, and all the ones that do care about the bats that they make, like the Sengir Nosferatu can only be brought back by the activated ability of the bat token that he makes, and, like, Timothy has to have the bat tokens be connected to the vampires to bring them back, so... Yeah, unfortunately not. While there are a lot of bats connected to vampires in Magic, um, Skeletal Vampire is really the only one that just uses bats as a resource rather than turning into one and turning back again. So far we are keeping all of the changelings until we get closer to the end and then I have to figure out like, which things I'm keeping, so that way I have the right number of each creature type. Uh, Bloodgast is on here, because he's, like, if we mill him, he's good value. Yeah, we're going to have to get rid of a bunch of the vampires. We have so many more vampires than anything else. And several of the vampires are very playable, so... That's, like, where a lot of our power is, is in the vampires. I wonder if we can get rid of Dark Imposter, too. It's six mana to activate. I probably don't care about the activated abilities of the creatures that he's exiling, because they're just um, what our opponents have. So that can be very hit and miss, whether the activated ability is actually relevant to our deck or not. And it's six mana to do it. The only upside is that it's a three-drop body and it's an assassin for Marie the Killing Quill, but in fact that might be the main reason to keep it is that we're almost definitely running Marie, so having an extra assassin or two. Okay, real quick, we'll get rid of the Mephidros vampire, so let's get him off of the vampire list too. Down here. Pop back up. Go down to 142. Then, let's see, Marie cares about assassins, so it says I have nine, but some of them might be in the names or repeated in the text, so one, Marie is two. Oh, Dark Imposter is on the list as removal and as um, a vampire. Marie's on the list twice, and then she's on the list for the exiling effect too. So almost, so it's Marie and the Dark Imposter, and then uh, her other things are rogues and mercenaries, and we shouldn't have any mercenaries, but Bonar's a rogue. Sanguine Spies a rogue. Uh huh. Alright. Mercenaries. It's literally just the references on Marie. Okay. So Marie herself is an assassin, so whenever she connects, uh, we would get to remove a hit counter, draw a card, and make two treasure. But if we get rid of any of the other ones, like, we're most likely keeping the Bonar because it's one of the few merfolk we can run. Oh, also all of the changelings. Right, we have, like, 15 changelings on this list. Never mind. Marie's fine, and we don't need to care if we get rid of any of her subordinates here, so... 
Okay, I think I'm good to remove the dark imposter, so let's go ahead and cut that. Okay, we do need to be a little more specific. So Marie can stay. But yeah, the other instances of Dark Imposter can go. We have plenty of creature kill and plenty of things that exile creatures instead of letting them go to the graveyard or when they go to the graveyard, so. We can just get rid of the Dark Imposter. Yeah, sorry, I had one of those moments where I'm searching for the specific types, and it's like, I only have these, so I won't have that many. I have changelings. I have so many changelings. I have literally every changeling that is mono-black or an artifact, and two of the artifacts that make them, and the enchantment that makes them. I have so many changelings on this list because I care about specific creature types. Not only is Marie fine, I have throwaway fodder to get through for the damage in order to draw my cards. And they will all have death touch when they're attacking as long as Marie's safe, so. And I even, because of all the ways I have to protect the Grim Captain, I have a bunch of different ways to protect Marie from getting removed before combat damage and getting rid of the death touch on my guys. Alright. Uh, that's that one off the list. Okay, we're at 142 or 141. Okay. Yeah, the more I think about it, the more I think I don't need Phyrexian Delver. Let's get rid of that. Like, it's not essential for what we're doing, and it's not one of the four creature types, so. It's just okay, and therefore easily cut from the deck. Wander, Ghostly Changeling, Nameless Inversion, <clears throat> Rune Stalactite. I'm sad Rune Stalactite itself doesn't have... Um, the changeling type, because that would be super helpful on it, because it would be a permanent, right, is it permanent or creature? Exiled creature, okay, so I still can't get it back, right, that was the same issue I had with, um, uh, the land, Univault, was that we could animate it and exile it to meet the requirements for one of the uh, three less represented creature types, but then we could never get it back because it's not a creature in exile, it's only a land. Uh, out of all of them, I most want to cut Hollow Sage. Like, if I had two other mono black merfolk, I don't think Hollow Sage would even be on the list at all. It is by far the worst. Like, even Mero Bonar is doing something, it's just doing a terrible job at it. So. Um. It's possible I just get rid of the, um, wound reflection effects, and then I can get rid of Blood Tribute. I'm wondering if I still get rid of Blood Tribute even if I leave in the wound reflections. Like, yes, it lets me outright kill a player, and potentially gain a bunch of life while doing it, but it's still not exactly what I'm looking for in this deck. Like, it feels like it's in here because it happens to interact with a couple other cards on the list, and it cares about vampires, so that's what made me put it down in the first place. But aside from the one vampire that doubles up the life loss from opponents... Um, it's not really, um, working in the deck, so. Yeah, I think I'm fine to cut it. Okay. 
I keep the Regent for right now because it just buffs all of our creatures a tremendous amount. If we get through once, we're probably getting through again if we don't get Wrathed. And that time it's going to be lethal or we're killing all of our opponent's stuff because they have to chump block everything because nobody Wrathed. Uh, indignation. Yeah, we need to go over the self-mill cards pretty soon. Like, after this pass, I think the next thing we'll do is self-mill and see if I can get rid of any of those. Then we will start figuring out the other creature types, I think. Because I already have vampires sectioned off, but we should probably do pirates too, just to see if there are any of those we can cut. The dinosaurs in the merfolk sectioning them off seems counterproductive when there's like five and three, I think, or four and three. Actually, it's five and three because of dino DNA. Because there's a fifth dinosaur, but it's the backside of the one artifact that makes an opponent discard a card. It's like a looks at their hand, you can choose a creature or artifact and they can discard it, and then it flips into a dinosaur skeleton with menace that self mills. And while that side of it is great uh, for this deck and would 100% make it into the deck, if I could treat it as that thing more consistently, the fact that it is only that when I flip it in play, and that it has to eat like two creatures out of my graveyard in order to be ready to flip is just like, yeah, that's eating up a resource I already value highly for a card that is only okay and doesn't always serve the function I need it to, so. So yeah, that one's out. But Dino DNA is like the fifth honorary dinosaur. That's actually a dinosaur since it makes dinosaur cards and is another graveyard hate card for our other sub strategy, so. <clears throat> I thought I cut Ran. I was definitely seriously considering cutting him the other day. We have enough other vampires. We can probably cut Ran. Like, not only do we have another, like, another, not only do we have enough other vampires, but we even have enough other cheap vampires, like, um, Bloodgast, um, the uh, Callous Blood Mage, uh, Viscera Seer, uh, Blood Throne Vampire, like all of them are cheap also. So we have early plays and they're better. Like, Vran can gain me some amount of life, and that's helpful with exactly the Vain Witch Coven, but gaining life with a ton of vampires in play is not exactly something I'm having a lot of trouble doing, so. I keep coming back to Soren as one of the things that we can cut, and yeah, we probably can. We have him on the list because of the minus three, so he comes down on four, and we can immediately minus three him and still have him be in play, and put one of these super expensive vampires into play on turn three, and that's cool, but that's the end of it for him, basically. Like, then he gets to plus a couple times gain me some life, get in for some damage, and then die. Because nobody's really going to want to let him sit around and keep doing that. Uh, also, the fact that he can plus to sack one of my vampires to deal three damage and gain me three life. Um, like, it's useful. All of this is useful, but none of it is insane, except for the minus three. And even then, like... We're putting something like Necropolis Regent or Skeletal Vampire or, um, like, Original Kalidus or something down. Like, those are some of our better, very pricey vampires. Like, the we could put down the 5-4 that when one of my things dies, you know, the Great Pack Vampire. 
but none of that is so incredibly powerful that it's just like, yeah, no, I desperately need Soren in this deck to help me do that. Paper, Creeping Bloodsucker. Creeping Bloodsucker is another one where it's like, at first it's like, yeah, no, that works because we gain as much life as it deals damage. So if we have three opponents, they each take one and I gain three every turn, but <clears throat> I have enough other life gain. We have to be a little careful. I don't cut too much of the life gain. Otherwise, the Vain Witch Coven has to go, and then I have to worry a little bit about all of the life loss ones that I'm running, but speaking of which probably can ditch Vengeant Vampire as a 6 drop 4-4 four, four lifelink like, it's nice that when it dies it gets to kill another one of our opponent's creatures on the way out but it's 6 mana for a 4-4 four, four lifelink and a lot of the other things we're doing at that Mana range are way more impressive, so. I'd actually cut Sheku, right? Like, this is her only spot on the list. Alright, Shaku, not Sheku. Yep, okay, so we already cut her from before. I do really like her. I was interested in putting her in the deck, but let's be honest, her game text is. Every upkeep, I lose three life. Tap her to exile an opponent's creature. Because she is not going to be the only creature in play. That's just not realistic, so. Alright, so we cut Shaku. Uh, we need to get rid of the Vengeant Vampire, the Creeping Bloodsucker, and Vran off of the other vampires. So, or off of the. Yeah, the other lists like the vampires and whatnot. So creeping bloodsucker gone entirely. Uh, Vran the executioner, Thrain, Thrain. I wonder what a Thrain is if it's anything. I'm just making up words and vengeant vampire. Okay. All right, so I have one, two, three, four, five, six, six cards off the list. So 135. Halfway through this session. All right, so self mill cards. Let's figure out what we have. I'm also going to add the ones that tutor things directly into my graveyard so buried alive um unmarked grave and tomb will also be on this because they serve the same purpose they put cards that i want from my deck into my graveyard or i can then use them as a resource so and tomb Chapter, Lightning Greaves, Smeric Orb mills me. Stinkweed Imp has Dredge 5. Fire, Cold Seal Heart, Damnation, Cairn Wanderer, Bling. Those. Extractor Demon Mills. Duke of Bog, Butcher of Malakir. Those. Bloodline Keeper doesn't mill. Regent, no. Drana, no. Belitus, no. Indignation Mills. If 
perpetual timepiece. Tracker, Dire Fleet. Moon Raider, Nave. Nope, none of those mill. The Tomb Robber explores, and that's kind of the same thing, but not really. Doom Whisperer, though, definitely mills me. Fire Triton, Brana. Priest, Bloodline Pretender, Maskwood Nexus. Eh, Warlock class, kind of, and that's part of the reason why it's on the list, but it's not the entire thing. Also, it does it once for one activation, so it's kind of not a great example. Um, similarly, Takenuma mills me as part of its effect, but again, it's a one-shot. I'm more concerned about the things I can use to either mill a a large number of cards like putting two to three cards in my graveyard is nice but we already cut um the balustrade spy because that's likely what it's going to do is just mill a couple of cards the one time so i'm more concerned like milling as a side effect for an effect that we only get to use once is a nice bonus with this deck but I need the mill card, like the cards that are specifically in here to mill me need to be very good at it. The cards that are bad at milling need to be doing something else, and they're going to stay in the deck or leave based on how well they do the other thing and that they mill as a bonus, so. But anything that can keep milling me every turn or mills me a large number, like Breach the Multiverse is a one-shot, but it's ten cards. Um, Liliana's Indignation is X, so... Yeah, like, Pile On lets me surveil the one time that I cast it, so... that, But that is here for its merits as a removal spell that happens to let me mill myself. Um... The Palantir is in here because it's a card draw effect that happens to let me mill myself. So, they are in here for their other value, not because they self-mill. But they get an added bonus to that value because of the self-mill synergies that they have while doing the thing that I put them in the deck for, basically. So... Our commander is a self-mill also. I don't feel the need to bring him down here. We just need the other stuff that helps him get where he's going. Let's see. None of these mill, I don't think. No. Unmarked grave. Yeah, the one-shots that put specific cards into my graveyard get on the list because they have a hybrid tutor mill function so i can put the thing i most want in the graveyard there so and their only purpose is to put cards from my deck in the graveyard so they have to stand on their merits as mill cards patron marie cavalry throne cisco Since we can't rely on consistently getting specific um, attractions into play, I don't know that I want to count uh, Trash Bin, for example. Alright, so... Or count the cards that could get Trash Bin for me. Alright, so these are my self-mill cards. Buried Alive, Whetstone, Entomb, Orb, Imp, 
Demon, Ignatian, Tice, Whisper, Tampering, Breach, Unmarked Grave, and Dread Summons. All right, so we currently have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So yeah, some amount of these have to go. Um, I'm thinking on Mark Grave. We have enough non-legendary creatures, but for one more mana at sorcery speed, I can get three of them, and for one less mana. At instant speed, I can get whichever creature I want in the graveyard. So it's kind of in the middle of both of the other Entomb effects. And it's probably okay to cut that one. Like, I think it's the worst of the one-shot ones, so... Um, I also think we can probably cut the Stinkweed Imp, despite all of the praises I gave it yesterday about it being able to, uh, peck in for damage at one point a turn, um, kill creatures it gets into combat in the air with, and, you know, potentially be the thing that steals me the monarchy or the initiative or something. Um, its primary purpose in the deck is to mill me, and I have to give up my draw step to mill five. <clears throat> And while that's okay some of the time, there are going to be times where I need to draw a card while milling also, like I need the resources in hand to do stuff while I'm trying to mill the cards into the graveyard so that way my other cards are working properly. So giving up my draw step in order for this thing to mill me five and having it be the card that I drew functionally um, is not the best. Out of all of our, like, self-mill cards, anyway. Yeah, I think we're safe to cut that. The biggest downside is that milling five, potentially every turn, under the right circumstances. The thing is, is though, we're not going to be getting attacked by things that the imp can't kill a lot of the time. So, it getting into combat and killing the thing means we're not going to be attacked every single turn cycle when we get it back and recast it. And opponents aren't going to have things they can just throw away against it. And if they are attacking with something indestructible, for example, um, that's helping us if we're milling and they would know that. So, either they have to have good graveyard hate at that point to make up for that. Or they have to have another plan, like it has to be a very large trampler and it's dealing damage to us at a significant clip. And even then, that's setting up our Grim Captain to come down and gain us lifelink, so opponents aren't just going to keep attacking us, and they're not going to block this thing that often, unless there's compelling reason to, like on behalf of their Planeswalkers, to keep the Monarchy, something like that, so... It's not like this thing is going to be every turn we get to mill five and put it back in our hand. Unless we have one of our ways to sacrifice it in play. And we have like four of those total in the deck, so. The biggest upside, I think, to it might be the fact that it is a relevant creature on the board. In addition, like Mesmeric Orb is a basically do-nothing artifact. It just sits there. It doesn't attack or block, protect our life total, you know, get rid of opponents' resources, anything. It just mills. So it's a lot worse than the Imp in that regard. But we can just tap all of our things and then untap on our turn and mill all of these cards. Also, interestingly enough, if we really need to mill... Um, if we have black spells to cast the stupid um, Marrow, we'll tap to exile a card from an opponent's graveyard, and then we will untap it by casting a black spell, and that will let us mill a card with the Mesmeric Orb. 
which is a very, very minor thing, because I don't know how many black spells we could realistically cast in a turn with this deck, but despite it being a mono-black deck, it's not exactly um, trying to storm off, basically. But it is something the deck could technically do to get a few extra mills in if we're like just trying to find that last changeling to flip the Grim Captain. Um, assuming that that one stays, because maybe it doesn't. It's close, though. This one can mill a ton of cards, which is super helpful. Um, I'm wondering if I need either the Dread Summons or the Indignation. So they're both good for big bursts of milling. Um... And the Dread Summons mills everybody else, and that can result in us exiling a large number of the cards going to their graveyard and basically killing them by decking them. At that point, if we're exiling all of the stuff, there's no way they can shuffle it back in in time to save themselves from decking. But that's only if it's the replacement effects, or if their thing is an instant speed to get all their cards back. I kind of like the perpetual timepiece to shuffle back in the important things that we've milled, so that way we can just mill with abandon and never care about what's going to the graveyard unless, like, the timepiece itself goes. Because if the timepiece goes, then I don't think we have any other way to shuffle cards, like, specific cards from our graveyard or every card. I don't want to shuffle every card. That's, like, the worst. We're using the graveyard as a resource. I don't want to hit, like, an Eldrazi Titan and shuffle everything back in, but or activate Elixir of Immortality. But the timepiece does give us a way to go, oh, hey, I kind of needed those to win, let me get them back. But at the same time, it only mills me two, so it's... Like, the throne is our commander, so the throne only milling two is kind of like, we have to accept that. But for the other self-mill cards, I'm wondering if we don't want to get rid of... The ones that only mill a little bit. The ones that mill specific cards I want. The ones that can mill a lot quickly I want. Yeah, I'm starting to think we don't need the indi indi indignation. I'm indignant at my inability to pronounce that card's name. Uh, we get rid of Indignation. We get rid of Red Summons, I think. So as far as I know, Breach does work with um, any of our exile effects that are triggers, the replacement effects will stop them from going to the graveyard in the first place, but anything that exiles as a trigger for going to the graveyard, uh, we would still get the opponents to mill the 10 cards, and we would still get to pick a creature, and then, after the spell is done resolving, uh, the triggers would go on the stack to exile, so depending on which one we have in play will determine whether or not Breach actually gives us our opponent's creatures. But I'm still willing to mill myself 10 and get one of my creatures back and exile the top 10 cards of all of our opponent's decks. I think, like, I still think that's decent enough. Like, a 7 mana mill 10 reanimate in a deck that wants to mill cards anyway seems okay. And the fact that it might have more upside depending on the board state. Because it's also possible that, like, they have no dead creatures, but we mill them. Like, they get rid of our thing after we've already exiled all their previous dead stuff. And then we get to mill them with Breach and get their things. Yeah, we get rid of the Dread Summons, we get rid of the Indignation... We can probably get rid of Extractor Demon, too. It's two cards per dead creature, but 
And not even dead creature, like it counts leave the battlefield effects too, because it wanted to count creatures getting exiled from unearth. So there's that. I think I keep Entomb and I think I keep Buried Alive. Whetstone we can activate multiple times in a turn. Doom Whisper we can activate multiple times in a turn. This Merrick Orb is a lot of cards, like, for every land we untap. So even if we just tap all of our lands at the end of the previous opponent's turn and then go to our untap step, that's still enough cards getting milled, I feel like. It's nearly impossible for this thing to not mill us if we want it to at least three cards a turn. So it's doing the same work as Cemetery Tampering. The only downside might be that Mesmeric Orb um, is not optional, whereas things like Cemetery Tampering are, or Timepiece or Whetstone. But at the same time, it's so many cards milled, and it is what my deck is trying to do. Okay, we definitely cut these, though, so that takes another five cards off the list. Yeah, let's cut all of them. So I stop slouching and get closer to the keyboard. the last thing with Liliana in the name. Imp. And get rid of Unmarked Grave. Alright, so five cards, five cards. All right, 10 more cards to go, and we only have to cut half of the cards left in the deck. Uh, what are we at right now? 52 minutes, so we're close to the hour mark. I don't think I'm going to get anything else cut that quickly. Um, yeah, I think we're good for right now. I was debating if I wanted to do two of these, but I think I'm slowing down a little bit in what I'm cutting. Like, we had all the lists to work with, but now that we've gone through all of that, I think it's going to be a little bit of slow going uh, to make cuts if I keep pushing myself. It helps if I stop and come back to it after a while and look at it with fresh eyes again, like to figure out what other things should be cut. So we're going to call it there. So thank you for watching, and I will see you next time. Have a good rest of your day.